Hello, and welcome to this edition of the Satellite Image Deep Learning Video Podcast Series. Today, I'm speaking with Dan Buscombe. Dan is a data scientist and geoscientist working on applications of computer vision, machine learning, and deep learning in aquatic environments, contributing to a range of applied science topics at the nexus of geomorphology, oceanography, and ecology. He has a PhD in coastal geomorphology from the University of Plymouth, United Kingdom, and 14 years of subsequent experience in academia and government science in both the United Kingdom and the United States. He is self-employed and currently contracted to the United States Geological Survey in Santa Cruz, California. His current focus is the automation of environmental data analyses and data extraction in coastal environments, and how to make machine learning methods robust to large-scale application. Much of his work involves mining large remotely sensed data such as from satellites, aircraft mission, and sonar. And without further ado, I give you Dan. Hi, Dan. How you doing? I'm very well. How are you doing, Robin? Really good, thanks. I'm really excited to be here to talk about the Doodleverse today. Uh, Likewise. So can, can you tell me what, what is the Doodleverse and what, what problem does it solve? Well, the Doodleverse is, um, I guess, first and foremost, it's a GitHub organization. Uh, that hosts a bunch of different software tools. And those software tools are designed for uh, purposes of image segmentation using deep learning. Um, it implements, there's a couple of different aspects to it. Um, the first thing is called Doodler, and it's an interactive image labeling tool. Mm -hmm. um, it's designed for, I guess, uh, segmentation of smaller data sets and also for creation of training data sets for subsequent uh, training of models to carry out in image segmentation. And, and I'm guessing that's where the, the doodle name came from. So you're drawing or doodling on, on an image. That's right. Yeah. So that that's kind of, it, it all started with doodler. Um, we came up with this way to kind of basically take the grunt work out of uh, creating label imagery for the purposes of this uh, image segmentation business. Um, you doodle on the screen and you kind of select the different classes that you can see, you doodle on them, and then you, it uses machine learning to complete the scene. So the Doodleverse ecosystem, what it allows you to do is, you know, train data or generate data, annotate it, train models, and somehow use those models. Uh, That's right, yeah. It's, it's a, I guess it's a full data to model pipeline. You know, it's, it's Doodler and Jim, they're, they're standalone tools, but they also work nicely together. You can use... If you have images and labels from some other labeling tool, you can use them with Jim, um, which is the, the model training library, um, or Doodler itself works kind of standalone if you just need to kind of segment a, a, an image or a set of images quickly. Um, and then both of the tools are kind of designed for, you know, for the most part, they've been tr uh, tested out with Earth observation imagery, you know, things like satellite imagery and aerial imagery. And, you know, another kind of motivation for the Doodleverse is to make these deep learning image segmentation tools a little bit more accessible for geoscientists you know people who not necessarily have like a huge amount of time to invest into you know learning about the different machine learning software and things like that so it, it's it's a you know it's kind of designed for geoscientists it's um it tries to be fully reproducible you know the doodler you can actually go back all the way back to the original doodles that you made on the screen and you know you can kind of trace all the way back uh, from your finished model all the way back to those original doodles. So it's it's fully reproducible in that way. And, Jim, and Jim is Jim is basically designed for experimentation. It's really it's really designed uh, with experimentation in mind because often we're in a situation where we just don't know how much label data we need. We don't know what the optimal hyperparameters are going to be for our segmentation model. And so a little bit of experimentation is always necessary in order to try and get that optimal model for you. So that's kind of what Jim is set up to do. I really like the sound of that. It's taking away some of the complexity around working with the code, allowing people to focus just on, on the problem itself. Fantastic. Yeah. It's on GitHub. So can we take a look at it? Sure. Uh, let me just go ahead and share my screen here. I'll share which one of my screens I need. Uh, let's do that one. So you should see the Doodleverse repository here. Um, as I said, there's there's these two main programs, the Doodle and the Gym, and then the third one that we're that we've been working on is this thing called Segmentation Zoo. Um, it's 
it's called Zoo because it's a collection of models that are already there um, that we've already trained, and they're kind of there for the purposes of um, you know kind of basic tasks that that geoscientists may encounter, like finding water or, or you know finding sediment or finding vegetation and things like that. So the the idea the idea with Zoo, and that's kind of still under 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 work, but. Um, the idea with Zoo is that it's this repository of pre-trained gym models if you don't want to uh, uh, do it yourself. Mm, um, so some people could potentially come along and they just want the model. They just they just go to the zoo and there'll be some interface where they can experiment and see if the model is good on their data. That's the idea, yeah. And and you'll also see, uh, if you go to the landing page of Doodleverse, which is just github.com slash Doodleverse, you'll see that you know that the, there's a lot of applications that we're building for the specific science that we're trying to conduct and they're based on zoo models so what we end up doing is we use gym to make the models they go into zoo and then they're kind of there's a, like an api that then you know interfaces with a, with other things that we're working on one, one of them is called seg2 map which is a mapping extension for for zoo so it's kind of taking your uh, image segmentation models and then using them on geospatial data specifically. And then there's this really specialized um, thing that we've worked on that's called Coast Train, uh, sorry, that's called Coast Seg, which is for specifically it's for extracting shorelines from satellite imagery of coasts. Um, and it's based upon a, a really good uh, toolbox called CoastSat, which is made by Killian Boss at UNSW. Um, so, yeah, say, that, that's a cartoon. That's not an outlook of the model, is it? Or is it actually an outlook of the model? No, that's a cartoon. I, I, I kind of I like these I like these retro um, logos. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, I mean, I've got I could I can I've definitely sh I can show you a few different things about these. Um, let me let me show you a couple of slides here. I guess um, you know this is kind of a higher level overview of of the Doodleverse. And as I said before, it, it, what we're trying to do here is to make it fully reproducible, try and make it accessible for geoscientists. And then there's these three different components um, that kind of all like come come together. I want to give a shout out to my colleague as well, Evan Goldstein, who's been you know my main collaborator over this, and he was the guy that actually came up with the name Doodleverse. And wow. uh, you know the, it comes from the Doodler tool which is, you know, that interactive uh, annotation tool. Um, and it, I think it's based, I think the name really comes from the Tidyverse, which is that R collection of packages. Um, and then Sharon, Sharon Fitzpatrick and Venus Ku, they're kind of young computer scientists who've been working with us to kind of pull these applications together. And um, this is kind of, this is kind of what Doodle looks like. It runs in a browser, so you can serve it. Uh, this is just a really simple example of where you, you know you might be just interested in finding that interface between water and land. So you just doodle on the screen um, on the different classes that are present, and uh, then you hit the button, and it basically then completes the scene. It uses um, two different machine learning algorithms under the under the hood: um, a multi-layer perceptron, which is just a basic neural network and what's called a conditional random field. And it's the conditional random field that gives it this kind of agency. It's, it, it's, it's called a human in the loop tool because there's a slight amount of agency to correct your mistakes if you don't think they're consistent in, across the entire scene. So is a model actually being trained somewhere there or is a model pre-trained and we're utilizing it? It's just being trained on the fly. So it really just, it's a kind of task specific tool. And you know, it's basically being trained when you saw that blue box appear on the screen. So it's designed to be fairly quick um, for each individual image. So you kind of step yeah. through Im images and, and until you're done. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Like the idea that we're actually training a model with each image or refining a model. Uh, yeah. And then this is Jim. Um, you know, that, that's basically just a really complex uh, diagram of what a residual unit looks like. A unit is a uh, what's called a fully convolutional model that um, basically takes an image, it extracts features from it, and creates a, a very small bottleneck, and then it uses uh, skip connections to upscale that image back into the label. And a residual unit is a is a more powerful flavor of a of a, of a vanilla unit that uh, uses residual connections to make the model deeper and more powerful at, at feature extraction. Mm. And, and in the in the gym, you can presumably change like, you know, the models that you use or is it is it one model for everything? 
No, there's there's different options. So Jim is really configurable. You can use so right now we've got the the, the basic unit in, encoded in it. We've got the residual unit. Uh, we have what's called a satellite unit, which is a, a unit that has a really flat architecture. It doesn't uh, increase the number of filters at every convolutional block. And then in the in the spring, we're planning to have a, a sprint so we can uh, add more models to it. You know, the, these days there's more powerful models potentially. Uh, things like attention units that use uh, self attentions and transformers um, and other different things. So right now we've got a few different, we've got a family of units, but in the future, maybe we'll have some more options. Wow, it's very exciting. It will enable a lot of experimentation to have all those uh, degrees of freedom. For sure. Um, this was a data set that we made using uh, Doodler, and then we kind of made models, um, you know, from that data set, um, and then those models are basically ending up in Zoom. And this kind of just gives you an illustration of what I do, kind of for my day job. And you know, this is this this is the typical imagery that I'm using. Things like Landsat, public imagery, public satellite imagery like Landsat and Sentinel, um, and then we're kind of training models um, to identify certain things. And you know, we're really just interested in basic quantities, like tracking the amount of sand. Um, finding water in different scenarios, you know, finding vegetation and, you know, even things like tracking the, the amount of wave breaking and stuff like that, because it kind of gives us a, an idea of uh, over time, how these coastal environments are, are changing. Um, and, you know, here's a, another example here. You, like Jim is actually set up to use any type, any number of bands, you know, coincident bands. This is kind of just one example where this is a, a you know the visible spectrum, this is the near infrared, this is the shortwave infrared, and Jim can basically take all of these, stack all of these bands together to make predictions. And and you know the specific things that we're trying to pull out of this are just you know just trying to track where the shoreline is over time, so we can get a sense of what coasts are eroding and when what are not. A question on that: Let's say I've got potentially two different sources of imagery. One is RGB, and one is multiple bands. Would the Jim be able to? Help you answer the question, which is which is the best imagery for that application? No, it wouldn't currently. It doesn't have any like model interpretation steps in there at the moment. But you would be able to figure that out through experimentation. I mean, one thing you could do would just be to train a model on just the visible spectrum, and then train an identical model with exactly the same parameters uh, on the on a near infrared band and you'd be able to tell that way i guess right now but in the future it would be good to to you know include more model interpretation um algorithms within this yeah i noticed the usgs logo down there does that mean that these models are already in in some live services not quite but that's definitely the end goal yeah it's just, right now we're kind of using this as a research tool uh, this particular example that you can see on the screen, that's a collaboration with John Warwick at the USGS and Killian Boss. And what we're trying to do here is, is actually um, measure the sediment wave that's coming out of the Klamath River. This is the, um, this is the Klamath River in uh, Northern California. But we've also used this, you know, it's not just the satellite imagery. We use this for lots and lots and lots of different types of applications. Um, here's an example where um, we're being funded by the Office of Naval Research to um, use segmentation to find uh, to find damage and to find sand overwash, which is basically when the storms dump the sand from the beach onto the town behind it. Um, that's another application, um, and this is kind of for the purposes of you know figuring out the changes that um, occur on the coast as a result of hurricanes. And is the input to to the well, I guess the annotation tool is it geotiffs or do you have to pre-process the data? And are there limitations on, on what kind of size images you can use? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. Right now, we don't use geotiffs because it's more general to kind of just use things like JPEGs and other common image formats. However, you know, a lot of our imagery comes it, it comes with that geospatial metadata already included. So what we've done is we've kept Jim and Doodler to be kind of data agnostic. You know, it's just using imagery. It doesn't care whether or not it's spatial. But then we've got this downstream application that we're building called Seg2Map, which basically takes the outputs of any uh, any gym model that you've trained and then applies it to geospatial image and as for image size that's a really good question you know this is something that we've kind of come back and forth over a lot over over while we've been developing this 
we've opted to recommend um, using small tiles. So, you know, if you have a very large uh, satellite scene or a very large author mosaic, um, the recommendation that we have is to kind of chop it up into smaller tiles, perhaps with even with overlap, and then train a model to be able to segment those um, at that scale, and then a subsequent process that would then stitch the outputs together to make to make the map. And one of the considerations there is because Doodler, you know, it it it's it does have tools for doing zooming and panning, but it's um, it's often more it's quicker and more efficient if you're stepping through lots of images to just not use those tools and just to draw on the scene at, um, at some scale that you can actually see all of the features without having to zoom in and out. So that's one consideration. And then another consideration is just the amount of memory that the, um, that, uh, that the gym models consume when you're training with large batches. We typically use GPUs um, to do this. It, it is set up to run on a CPU as well, but we typically use GPUs. And one of the limitations of GPUs is that they're very memory limited if you don't have like a big stack. Um, you can train Jim across multiple GPUs, but even in that scenario, you probably still want to use fairly small image tiles because you want to keep your batch sizes large so the model converges quickly. Some really good details in there. And just just another sort of question on the detail side. Does it does the size of the, the tiling have an impact on the final result strongly? From what you said, it sounds like it would. Is that also yeah, I, a hyperparameter you'd want to experiment with? Yeah, I'd say it does. I think we're still in the process of figuring out exactly how that varies and under what scenarios. But I would say that, you know, my advice at the moment is is always to kind of use overlap because it's better to oversample the imagery. You know, if you, if you can tile up your large satellite scene with like 50% overlap, then you can you have an opportunity for that model to see each pixel twice. And then you can do things with that. Like you can actually quantify uncertainty or average out uncertainty. Um, but yeah, the specifics of that, I think, would depend from application to application. So, you know, as we go forward and we start, we, we continue to write papers um, that use these tools for the purposes of coastal science and coastal monitoring, then that's something that I'm going to pay attention to as we go, just so we have some sense of, of how to communicate what, what variability to expect uh, with different image sizes. You know, one of the limitations of units is that they have a specific cardinality that mean that you can't use every single uh, combination of sizes. You have to adopt, you know, certain sizes that that sorry, excuse me, that fit within the model architecture. Yeah, that's a really interesting point with lots of practical uh, implications, of course. But it'd be fantastic to dive into uh, a live session, maybe, and see uh, the API and how you actually would would train a model very very briefly. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so let me, that will require sharing another screen. <laughs> so why don't I start here with, um, I'm going to start here with the configuration file. You know, this is, so I'm going I'm to step through like what a, hopefully you can see this text file here. Um, what I'm going to do is step through like how you would actually run a gym model. And a lot of, and as I said before, you know, it's all, it's kind of all set up to be reproducible and to, to be experimental. You know, the first step of reproducibility is just documentation. So it's really useful every time you do an experiment, it's just to create a new config file that has all of the decisions that you made that, that went into that model. And this config file is, is kind of a, it's kind of a mess, you know, it's kind of a lots of different things here, but once you master this, then you've kind of mastered the process of using the software. And it has lots of different decisions, like lots of different things in here from, you know, what size that you, you know, what size of the imagery that you're working with to what type of model you want to run. This one here, this is a ResUnit, but if you could, you could specify a different model in here. This is a really simple model that just has two classes, um, but it can deal with any number of classes. You know, the, I'm here I'm working with three band imagery, but again, this could be more, this could be several more bands if, if that's what the, the solution required. Um, there's, you know, there's options here for including dropout and then specifying how that dropout is used within the model. Dropout is a is basically a tool to prevent uh, overfitting of the model. It randomly drops neurons in the in the layers to um, to make the model work harder for its solution. Um, there's options for different loss functions. I mean, we've got 
it already encoded within Jim. You can use dice, you can use weighted dice, you can use categorical cross entropy, you can use Kubler Liebler distance. There's lots of there's hinge, hinge die, uh, hinge loss, there's all these different types of loss functions that you can use for image segmentation. Um, so anyway, so it's all kind of in here in the in the config file, and you know, to the point where you can um you specify how augmentation happens through use of these different parameters. Augmentation is again, it's something that we recommend and is, is generally recommended for the purposes of um, deep learning models in general, because you know it allows the, the model to generalize better and to transfer better to out of distribution data, um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, another thing here that's fairly important is um, is the the way that the 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 learning rate that the model uses throughout its training, we found by fairly exhaustive experimentation, we found that uh, a learning rate scheduler is, is quite good to use. And what that does, it, it just specifies what your learning rate is at every every training epic during the model training. And that's a really that's a there's a couple of different levers there that you can that you can pull on to really make your model better by by getting an intuition for how how that learning rate affects model training. So, so the gym is encoding some best practice that you've learned working with this kind of imagery, right? That's right. Yeah. And that's that's kind of why we call it opinionated software is because it kind of has some of our opinions baked into it. Um, you know, things things like that learning rate um, would, would definitely be one. Um, so once you've once you've got your configuration file together, you know, that, as I said, this is a simple one that just uses uh, two classes and three bands. Um, then you're in a position where you can uh, actually use this for the purposes of training. So there's there's three scripts within Segmentation Gym. The first one is um, make data set. So you would run Python, whoops, uh, Python make data set. And what that does is it just, it prompts you to select an, a folder of images and a folder of labels. And then it will create a set of um, compressed NumPy or NumPy format files called MPZ files that are just archives that contain a, a, a serial serialized binary string of that data that you can then feed to TensorFlow datasets. Now that's an important step because TensorFlow datasets is a really really good API for managing throughput of your data to your GPU or to multiple GPUs. Um, you know, it's it's all set up to basically maintain to make sure that that GPU is never starved of data, but it's also it's never like overfull either. Like you're you're basically feeding it the data at the requisite rate so the model can train most efficiently. And I won't go through uh, that process. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm just curious. I, I worked a bit with TensorFlow Records. Is that got similar properties, or is there a reason why you went with the NumP approach? Yeah, we uh, TensorFlow Records, the same concept. Um, the only so that one of the disadvantages of TensorFlow Records, and we did adopt TensorFlow Records immediately at the start, and then we dropped it in favor of the um, MPZ format because the MPZ format has value in itself. You can actually load it directly into NumPy if you're just doing a, a simple Python script to just check the data or to you know do something with the data. Then it's a lot easier if you're a NumPy user to just use a NumPy format, and you know you can you can actually you can just click. Let me sorry, I got loads of little screens here. I should actually maybe I'll just share this whole desktop. You know you could actually um, you can open up one of these files, these NPZ files. So this is you know one that I made earlier. You can actually open these up, and you'll see that it's an archive of different NumPy arrays. And so it's really easy to use within a Python script. That's the image, that's the associated label, that's the name of the file that it was based on, um, and then that's the number of bands, and that's just for programmatic reasons. And you'll see that you know in this in this um, in this folder here, this has been generated by that make dataset script, and you can see that some of the data has got org, and then some of the data is no org, and so you can tell and you can use either augmented data or non-augmented data or both. And that's a that's a um, something that you can specify. And that's simply done by just running train model. Um, it's, I'm gonna be prompted here to tell it exactly where that data is. Um, 
this is just this kind of a uh, this is just the last model that I trained actually. So that's why I'm using this example. It's actually I'll show you in a minute what it is while the model trains. Um, but what it's doing is um, is just finding coins in images. Coins. <laughs> Which <laughs> coins? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'll ex and I'll explain why uh, in a second. Let me just get it running here. So. Data set it made that data set, and that, that config file is is going to be the same config file that's going to dictate how the model training happens. And then what it first there's a whole bunch of like warnings here. It's um, it's running on a single GPU at the moment. It's actually running on a 3080 Ti, which is I think it's got like 12 gigabytes of memory. Um, and now it's stepping through its training. So while it's training, and we'll come back to that in a second. And while it's training. I'll just show you, you know, what the data is itself. Um, uh, it's an interesting one. It's just, it's just images of digitized coins on sand, uh, because that was the last, that was the last model that I trained, and that's actually in support of a, an application that I'm working on called SandSnap, which is uh, for the purposes of quantifying um, beach sediment grain size. So it's a citizen science project where. Uh, people upload images of uh, you know, mobile phone images of uh, beach sand. They upload it to the cloud, and then this model that I'm training basically finds the coin to scale the image. And then there's another model mm. that, that that computes what the grain size is. So anyway, that's that's just the example data set that I put together here. But um, cool. you know, if if you look back at the, the that's basically just images. You know, images a folder of images and then a folder of associated labels. Um, but going back to the model training, you know, we're not going to have time, obviously, to see it fully trained. But what it's doing here is basically just doing its thing. It's just using back propagation, obviously, to set those model weights. Um, one of the things you can do in the config file is to just to exactly specify, you know, what proportion of data you're going to use for training versus validation and things like that. Um, and then another thing that it's kind of doing at the moment that's um, fairly important for this process is it's using mixed precision training. Uh, what we found is that a lot of these segmentation models perform really well, even if you don't use full precision. Um, um, so it's using kind of mixed floating precision. And what that does is it allows you larger batch sizes because it consumes less memory. And because of that, it trains faster and it converges faster and you can do your experiments quicker. Fantastic. So. I, I, is it possible to sort of give a ballpark figure like how how long models take to train on a machine like this for a typical data set? Yeah, um, this data, I guess, this data set is fairly small. It consists of um, a few hundred images, and mm. this model this model will be done probably in about two hours. Um, mm. Other models that I've made um, are considerably larger. Um, that use upwards of 10,000 or even more than 100,000 pairs of images and labels, depending on the application um, and depending on the available data. And those models contain, uh, sorry, can train for you know up to a day or even more than a day on a single GPU. Um, these are kind of commodity GPUs that regular scientists like me might have access to. Um, the gym is set up to do multi-GPU training, though. So if you have multiple GPUs, you can specify that in the config file. You just give it the numbers. You know, you've got zero, one, and two, for example. If you had three GPUs, and it would train, um, it would train a lot quicker if you did that. So but potentially, also, you could just run this entire process on a cloud infrastructure and yeah. sweep across lots of different parameters and just centralize the logging somewhere. And yeah, for sure, it, it's definitely set up to do that. Um, you know, either a cloud or high performance uh, computing situation, you can set this up to just run for days if you need to. Um, as you say, like just cycling through different configuration options. What a week that would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, it'd be a week where you'd be glad that you wouldn't be paying for the electricity bill. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Warm your hands on the computer. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, and so once you've got this trained model, it's also possible to to use it in inferencing, I suppose, in in a notebook, or have you got another another way? Yeah, to do that? yeah. So right now we've we've got you know if you look at the segmentation gym folder, you know we've got these three basically it's just three different scripts, 
Um, I've shown you the, the, the first two here. And then the last one's called just seg images in folder, a terrible name. Um, it, you just use that to then, you point that at an, an, a set of images they might have. And there's a few options in there for inference. Um, but we're also kind of planning on baking this, some of this, um, some of these ideas into segmentation zoo. Let me just stop sharing my screen here and I'll share that other screen and I'll show you the, the uh, segmentation zoo um, just really quickly. So segmentation zoo, um, as I said, it's still under development, but what we're planning on doing here is as well as providing um, a repository of, of already trained models um, that will each have a Zenodo release and a model card explaining the the origin of the data and the config file and all of that. We've started to make uh, Jupyter notebooks that just, you know, that provide guidance on how to best use these models. Um, so this is one, this was the first one um, that we wrote. There's a couple on there and they, they have different complexity. You know, there's, there's a very simple application where you just take a model and you just point it at a single image and then you run with the outputs that it gives you. You know, the, the model is, is, is the deep, deep learning models are probabilistic in nature. So you get a set of probabilities for each of the classes that you're interested in for each pixel. And you can just use the argmax, argmax function to then kind of determine what is the most probable class for that pixel. And this is a, a, a notebook that kind of steps through that process. Um, there's an image here of a coastline. Uh, it's a model that's trained to detect four different classes and, you know, it kind of just steps through each of the probability scores for each of those classes um, that's been outputted by the model. Um, look at the, the confidence metric, which is basically the distance to the, thres the, the decision threshold, which is usually 0.5. And then, you know, going through the process of actually creating in that output. Um, it's really nice. It says it's kind of unsure around the boundaries in general. In general, yeah. Um, and then there's a couple of different other things. Uh, there's a couple of different notebooks that, that I've made that show then how you would use a model for ensemble predictions. So that is a situation where you have a number of different models trained for exactly the same task. They may have seen different data or they may have been trained using different um, hyperparameters. And there's, you know, anyone who's interested could go on and look at those notebooks and you'll see that there's a, a number of different decisions that you can make about how to you how to actually combine those those different model outputs together to make that prediction and to come up with a confidence metric for each one. That's really interesting. That's that's one of the questions that I've heard about. How do we interpret the confidence of predictions? And so having that that second map essentially to interpret the results I think will be really useful for understanding what models are picking up on and what they're failing at. Yeah, you don't get a true probability. So all neural networks are what's called discriminative models, not generative models. It's, it's generative models that get you, you know, quote unquote true probabilities, which are the joint the joint probabilities between the features and the labels. And neural networks tend to be or well, exclusively discriminative models. And really, so the problem is, you know, it's just the, the, the probability of the label given the features that the model saw during training, which is a very different beast. And so it's not really a true probability. Um, you know, a, a statistician, I guess, wouldn't call it a true probability. But, I, I, but I'm no statistician. I just want to make these things work. And I, I want to make them useful for people. And I want to provide as many different examples of how you may be able to cobble together your own model for your own purposes. That's kind of what I'm about. That is a fantastic aspiration and a really, really good note to, to end on with doing that. So the code is and the models, I guess, all on, on GitHub and you're, you know, you're happy to accept uh, contributions and, and oh, users on that. Right. And uh, you've also recently started a consultancy. I, I guess this is somehow factored into the work you're planning on doing uh, in your consultancy. Is that right? That's right. Yep. I have a consultancy and I'm working on a contract at the moment with the U.S. Geological Survey um, here in Santa Cruz, California. Um, I And by, by training, I'm a coastal scientist. And so I am working basically on applying these uh, machine learning models to different um, applications of uh, for the USGS. Um, and this a lot of this work was was funded and supported by the USGS too. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you for the for the overview. I'm looking forward to kicking the tires and doing some experimentation myself. Uh, if people want to reach you, where's the best place to, to contact you? Find me on GitHub. Uh, put an issue yeah. in on the Doodleverse. Um, make open a new discussion point, and one of us will get back to you. And we're very Fantastic. we'd be very happy to receive anybody's contributions and to get anyone's feedback. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, and we'll catch you next time. That's great. Thanks, Robin.